Booger Jackson jumped off the freight train in East Bank, West Virginia, just after noon. He was grateful for the chance to get off the train and stand on solid ground while it made a scheduled stop to unload fuel and coal in the small town. Feeling depressed and stressed, Booger lit a joint and squinted his eyes as he slowly turned around. He was tired, hungry, and low on cash. He figured he might as well head into town to see what it had to offer and hope to find an easy way to make some money. He knew he was a thief, a stoner, and a drifter, but this didn't bother him too much. What did occasionally trouble him was the thought of ending up forgotten, face down in a river, without leaving any legacy behind. The town sprawled out before him like a relic from a bygone era, its buildings sagged, paint peeling away, and trash choked the streets, hiding any signs of life. There were no formal restaurants, only inns and bed and breakfasts, offering all-you-can-eat buffets to the locals. The only other businesses that seemed to be thriving were a small, beat-up general store, a funeral parlor, and a newer establishment with a sign that read, East Bank Treasures. This shop was more than just a retail store. It was the centerpiece of an ambitious project led by Margaret Sinclair, the mayor's wife. Margaret had invested a significant portion of her personal collection into the store, hoping to attract tourists and revitalize the struggling town. The display cases sparkled with jewelry that had once been hers, representing not only a lifeline for East Bank, but also a chance to turn a profit on her cherished possessions. Booger's clothes were tattered, and his face showed signs of worry. He hoped his appearance wouldn't draw unwanted attention before he had a chance to steal. The doorbell rang softly as he entered the dimly lit shop, filled with handcrafted trinkets and gleaming jewelry. No one seemed to be around, and the place seemed like it could hold the key to a quick fortune. With practice swiftness, Booger grabbed several pieces of high-quality jewelry and trinkets from an unlocked display case behind the counter. His brief thrill of success was shattered by a piercing voice from behind him. Call the sheriff. Someone's stolen from us. Panic surged through Booger. He turned to see a middle-aged woman with black horn-rimmed glasses scowling and pointing at him. Thief, she screamed. Stop right there. He sprinted past her, out of the shop, and down Main Street, heading toward a tree line several blocks away. He hadn't thought about what he would do if he got caught. He had no transportation and was running away from the railroad depot. The cars he saw on the street were either occupied by gawking townspeople or looked like they were from the 1950s and unlikely to outrun a modern police car. When he reached the dense line of overgrown bushes, he literally dove into them, breathless and anxious. Minutes felt like hours as the sound of shouting deputies and barking dogs grew louder. His heart raced as he bolted past run-down storefronts and through vacant lots, the relentless barking reminding him of the danger hot on his heels. In his frantic escape, Booger stumbled into a desolate part of town where abandoned factories and rusted machinery loomed like ghosts of East Bank's industrial past. He pushed through tangled weeds and debris, the dogs barking growing ever closer. At the end of a crumbling street, Booger skidded to a stop in front of the old grain factory. The towering mountain behind the factory seemed insurmountable. To his right, the Kanawa River roared menacingly. To his left was a steep drop littered with broken glass and rusty barbed wire leading into a huge landfill. In front of him, the factory's sagging walls and broken windows offered a grim sanctuary. Desperate and disoriented, Booger spotted an old, neglected dumpster at the back. Without hesitation, he ran toward it and jumped inside, hoping to hide. Horror struck when he landed. The dumpster was filled with thick, greenish, smelly goo that clung to him like a living nightmare, its corrosive nature burning his skin. As he flailed, he realized he had plunged into toxic sludge, the goo was corrosive, and his skin reddened and blistered where it touched him. The sheriff's deputies soon arrived, their voices sharp and urgent. I ain't going in there for all the tea in China, one shouted. Yeah, 
If he's hiding in there, he's as good as dead. Let's get the hell out of here. The deputy's footsteps faded away, leaving Booger in grim silence. He hesitated, unsure if they had really left. Eventually, he slowly lifted the dumpster lid and peered out. The streets were now deserted, with only abandoned machinery standing as silent witnesses. It was cold, and the sun was beginning to set. The only sound was the relentless roar of the river. The goo continued its agonizing work, seeping into every crevice of his body and clothing. He could barely move his legs. Nevertheless, he pushed himself up and over the lid of the dumpster with all his strength, collapsing onto the rough, gravel-covered ground. Desperate for relief, Booger staggered toward the river, hoping the icy water might cleanse him. The air was bitter as he dragged himself through the muck. Reaching the riverbank, he collapsed beside the dark, swirling current. He squirmed ahead into the water, the contamination mixed with the river's flow, creating a menacing whirlpool. The frigid water only intensified his pain, and as he submerged, his skin continued to dissolve. His cries for help were swallowed by the roaring river. Losing control of his movement and in excruciating pain, Booger sank face down into the icy water. The unyielding current pulled him under as his last senses informed him that his body was coming apart in large clumps. In his final moments, his desperate struggle was a silent, futile fight against the river's icy grip. Miss Margaret's beloved jewels escaped his dissolving pockets and were washed away with the powerful currents. As dawn broke over East Bank, its residents went about their daily routines, blissfully unaware of Booger Jackson's grim fate. Days passed and the mystery of the stolen jewelry faded from the townsfolk's minds, overtaken by their daily lives and preparations for the annual Catfish Festival. Fishermen gathered on the banks of the Kanawa River, preparing for the event, oblivious to the river's contaminated state. The residents continued to use the river water for drinking, cooking, and bathing, noting only a strange metallic taste they attributed to the town's aging infrastructure. The growing contamination went unnoticed, gradually affecting every aspect of their lives. At the local eatery, conversations turned to the old grain factory and the town's worsening condition. Stories of the factory's dark past circulated, with older residents reminiscing about its role in East Bank's rise and decline, and the mysterious illnesses that had afflicted former workers. Many avoided the factory, feeling it carried a toxic miasma that worsened their health when the wind blew in a certain direction. Complaints of headaches, nausea, and vomiting were common. No one did anything about the old factory due to a long-standing legal dispute over back taxes and the illegal dumping of toxic waste into the river. Margaret Sinclair's ambitious project, East Bank Treasures, was meant to be a beacon of renewal. But the poisoned water and deteriorating public health overshadowed her efforts. Her once hopeful investment was increasingly overshadowed by the town's growing crisis. As for Booger Jackson's remains, several clumps of them washed up on the banks of Charleston, West Virginia. A group of boys throwing rocks into the river spotted a dark green, writhing mass of goo teeming with horseflies, maggots, beetles, and other insects. It stank horribly and looked like a giant piece of moving snot. One brave boy, finding a stick, dared to poke it. The boy crept toward the huge, jiggling, slimy lump. As soon as he got within five feet, it became motionless, as if sensing his presence. When the stick punctured it, the goo surged up the stick, wrapping around the boy's hand and then his arm. It slithered into his open, screaming mouth. The other boys, seeing what was happening, ran off in terror. Booger Jackson needn't have feared that his legacy would be forgotten. In a short time, his remains spread the deadly infection across the entire nation. He would be known as Patient Zero in the historical records of the last survivors on planet Earth.